Hey, welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to another installment of TAPS Tuesday. Thank you for being here. Before I introduce our guest of honor, and I'm very excited about it, uh, just want to remind you all that if you have questions today, we totally encourage them. Just put them in the chat thread and I'll, and I'll pose them to our guests. Uh, we certainly appreciate your involvement. Uh, so if you have questions that come to mind, there's no silly questions. Our guest today is extremely patient. He's one of the most patient people I know. Uh, so, you know, ask away. Um, as you know, we are in the process of taking applications for the second annual TAPS LA Music Festival. Uh, this is for college age students up to 30, I believe, Harrison, 30 years old. I think 30 is not too, too old for the TAPS LA Music Festival. Uh, check out our website. Um, we are able to do these interviews because of donations from people like you. So we would highly appreciate a minimum donation to TAPS, which is a nonprofit organization of like $2. That would be wonderful. Um, that's how we're able to interview people like our guest, and they're able to give away things like a free lesson. Um, our guest is the principal timpanist of the Houston Symphony Orchestra. I Got to know him just a little bit for the first time at last year's PASIC. And uh, we actually did an interview for a documentary that I'm working on with uh, the editor that I worked on the Alan Abel documentary with Susan Bloom. And this guest today is such an outstanding individual. The interview was unbelievable. And if we can recreate just a smidgen of that today, I'd be thrilled. Please welcome Mr. Leo Soto. Leo, thank you for being here. Hey guys, well, obviously huge honor to be here. Always a great time talking to you, Ted. I know we uh, got a chance to meet uh, and spend some time together actually at that pacing, but then we just started talking and you know, it, was, it just went on. So it's always a, a great time. It was, it was great. Yeah, we were also hanging out. I, I forget, it was my first night there. And I walked into that, that restaurant at the hotel where they had like, the plastic up, it was under construction, but like it didn't keep anyone from having a big party. So that was kind of fun too. Basic party, always good. It was always good. Leo is uh, the principal timpanist of the Houston Symphony since 2018. But before that, Leo, you were timpanist of the Charlotte Symphony. And I've got some questions about that. But what really struck me about your bio, and it's, it's just so stunning to me. It says, Leo has the unique distinction of being the first native Hispanic timpanist to play in a major orchestra in the United States. First of all, it's an, it's an incredible distinction, uh, you know, and it speaks to your perseverance and your dedication to your craft and your musicianship. But I wonder if it says some other things too. And I, I guess my question is, how can this be? How can you be the first native Hispanic timpanist to be in a major orchestra? It's, um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a huge thing when I found out through a friend of mine that told me, look, I think we, do, we should do this research because it's quite possible. And the only reason why it's in there, why I wanted to mention is because from the very beginning, and, and this happens, I go with this mentality every time I visit my country, uh, Chile, and I get to go to any of the other countries around the area. It's just to represent the possibility. Like this has been done, and you, anybody can do it if you put the work, if you put the hours, as, as we all know. But, you know, like being South American, it's always harder to get things. Like Steve Weiss doesn't deliver there, for instance. So right. if you wanna get, if you wanna get a pair of concert sticks or something, it, it's hard to get them. You always pay more and it takes whatever. So, you know, it's, it's, I know it's complex. It's not an easy road. And that's why it's there because it's just to make sure that when you read that, when people see that, they can understand that it's, it's actually doable. It's something that needs to be done and needs to be done more often. There's yeah. no question about that. But, but obviously there are certain, certain barriers to entry. And what, the first one you mentioned is that if you're living in Chile or, or, or Peru, it's probably hard to get a Steve Weiss order of the stuff that your competition is using. Not to mention some of these boutique makers you know, Jeff Luft, for instance, you know, would he be able to ship to Chile easily? I don't know. So there's that. What about what about education? What about your education and, and talk about what that was like? 
I remember my very first books were the photocopy of the photocopy of the photocopy of the photocopy. Like we actually had to like go, we borrow it, you go make a copy of it and then you had to get up, grab a pen and actually write on top of it so you can actually see what it was. Because there's, you know, somebody at some point had come here and studied. And that person, uh, his name is Juan Kodersh. He came on a special scholarship. This was late seventies uh, and, and went to CIM actually and studied with uh, Claude Dove and Richard Winner. And he came, he came to Chile and, uh, and started showing the German setup of the drums and started talking about spending time practicing triangle, which up until that point was like, who's spending time practicing triangle, you know? And then, and then he started explaining everything and you go like, yeah, that makes sense, right? So um, that's, it was basically, if you really wanted to know, that was the person. And then it kind of started to expand from there. And at some point he got sick of teaching. He just, he never teach anymore. Uh, so whoever pay attention during those years kind of like started the school. And then at some point you knew you had to pick up on your own and figure out how you can develop more. Some of us from my generation uh, came here, a few of us came here and then they went back to Chile and some of them went to Europe. And I, a few of them are actually, there's two Chilean percussionists in the Munich Opera. And then uh, there is a few other percussionists playing in other orchestras in Germany. Uh, and, then, uh, and then from the ones that came to the US, uh, a few of them went back and now they're members of the National Symphony. And, uh, and I decided to stay here. And, and that was a turning point. When, when, uh, when I came here, I came on a scholarship. Um, it was a South American uh, uh, company, no company, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, a funda foundation. It was a uh -huh. foundation that was giving scholarships to students that will uh, deserve it. So you had to audition, right? This was and for college? This was for, uh, for college, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah, this was for college. So I came here at 21. And um, from that group, um, you know, it was a two year program. So after the two years, we will go back. And after my two years, Tim Adams, who was my teacher, I had a conversation with him and I said, look, going back to Chile, I know what the options are. There's only two majors orchestra, right? And they're both in Santiago and they both have younger percussionists at this point. Do you think that I, if I stay here, I could actually make a career and win a job? And, uh, and he said, he said, well, first, first thing is, yes, you can, but you have to work, you know, five times as hard as anybody else, number one, and number two, you have to have the stomach because you're going to get a lot of no's, which I did, right? You have and, to have the stomach. The stomach. Yes. To, to, to prepare for an audition, to go there, to play your best and get cut on the first round and come back and do it again. You have to have the stomach to go through that. And that was, that was a turning point for me. I, I figured, okay, this is what it takes. Let's just, let's just go and do it. And, uh, Unbelievable. Thankfully, thankfully yeah. Here we are. Well, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't like a straight shot either. I mean, that's, that, that's the other interesting thing about your, about your career trajectory is that you played in the Charlotte Symphony, which I, I don't mean to belittle because it's a great orchestra. Um, but you know, maybe it's the, it's the half Jew in me, uh, from New York. I'm like, you know, I was training to be an attorney and it's like, Hey, where's the money at? And it's like, when you're thinking about Charlotte and you're thinking about Houston, there's a big difference. And obviously you spent time in the Charlotte symphony. You spent almost 10 years there and then you, you win Houston. That's, that's kind of late. So, so may I ask, how old are you now? I'm 45 now. Yeah, so like by standards of, you, you know, I'm older, so I can say this, um, by standards of people taking auditions, you're like an old timer. Absolutely. So, yeah, so, so that's another incredible distinction about, about what you did. While you were in Charlotte, um, I imagine that, you know, you're thinking the whole time about getting, getting to the next place. And so, but you must have had some self-doubt about whether or not that was going to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. So... The, the two lessons that I learned from that, one is you have to make the most of what you have. So at that point, it was the Charlotte Symphony. Before that, it was the Michigan Opera. That was my very first job. Uh, and I think I was making like $18,000 a year at the Michigan Opera at that time. So I was taking gigs. I was driving up and down. I was coaching soccer. Uh, All right. I was coaching soccer up in northern, northern Detroit. And... Uh, 
and I was driving to uh, I was driving to Cleveland every every six weeks to take lessons, and then I'll go back because then you know the point was to get to the next step, and then it was Charlotte. So when I was in Detroit and when I was in Charlotte and when I'm here, for me it's always been okay. This is where I am right now, so I'm gonna make the best of what I have, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out. I went to listen to the Cleveland Orchestra so many times. I heard the Pittsburgh Symphony so many times. I will go to Philadelphia, hear the orchestra. When I was in school, we'll drive to Philadelphia, hear the orchestra, and then drive to New York and see whoever was playing at Carnegie Hall, and then drive back to Pittsburgh at that night. So I heard these orchestras, and I wanted to be in an orchestra that sounded like that. Yeah. Because that was the point. So so I play in these orchestras, which, again, we're not going to take anything away from there, because I, I think the Michigan Opera Theater is actually a great orchestra. It's a yeah. Great orchestra. Um, it just it wasn't what I had in my in my ear, you know. So it, it was just a matter of okay, I'm making the most of what I have here. I'm gonna make it my New York Philharmonic right now, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pushing for the next one. And then the age thing, uh, right right before I got this job, Shannon had won St. Louis, and he I think he won at 44 or somewhere around that time. Yeah, he was he was an old timer. And he and then he he stepped up and won like three auditions in a row, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So and and he's he was older than me, so I figured if he did it, then there's no reason why I couldn't do it, right? Yeah. So uh, you know, that's always there's always, you know, something something pushing. Yeah, you had you had a role model too, and and uh, you know, that's something that I think is you know, as an educator, we're talking about a lot. And I think it's another reason why it's important to talk about your distinction as the first native uh, Hispanic to be in um, or South American to, to be in a, a major orchestra as a timpanist. How important is it that your role models be look like you? I mean, I, I guess to that point, you're blazing a trail now. Right. And I, I, I think that you, you put it on your website for specific reasons to, to say this is possible. Correct. And so the first question of is how important is it for your role models to be, you know, to look like you? It's, I mean, I, this is another thing that I learned actually from Tim. Yeah, Tim Adams made a point to play every educational concert with the Pittsburgh Symphony. All those concerts that the principals would take off. Right. right? The Saturday morning concerts. Was like, he said to me at that time, he said, it's important to me that the kids that come to this concert see a black man playing in the orchestra. Yeah. They need to see that. So then they know that there is someone like them doing that. And obviously I learned that, I learned that from him. Obviously I'm not super dark, you know, but uh, people that come to concerts at some point, they, they know, right? There is a Hispanic person playing in, in the orchestra. And, you know, and this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big position in there. And you know, it's 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 basically one of the best things you can do outside educating, you know, one to one. And I, I would say without question, I mean to answer my own question, um, I I know that it's easier when you see your, your role models and you see it's possible, you you know, you say, Oh, that I can relate to that. And I'm sure that you are now gonna serve as an inspiration to people in, in Chile and elsewhere because you've achieved it. Um, but I think you point to another interesting thing, which is without this lineage, without this uh, person that studied in the States and then came back to Chile and started educating, would it have happened? And then, then I think it basically points to the fact that orchestral percussion specifically, it almost has to be passed down. It has to, there has to be a lineage. You can't just interpret what's on the, on the page and that, that's not going to work. You need to have prior knowledge and, and understand the lineage of it, yeah? Yes, yeah, some, have some sort of concept in school. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I'm, and I'm very thankful that that was the case in that. And I also got super lucky, the fact that the guy that came here those, all those years ago and started with Claude Dove, learned the German style and all that, and went back to Chile, and I was taught to play timpani German just because of that school. And I got so lucky that this foundation gave me a scholarship that I landed in Pittsburgh where Tim was teaching. That he had started with Chloe Love, he plays German. I was just, it was just like a coincidence that happened once. And, you know, I was so thankful about that because it was just like a continuation of what, of what the, the schooling I was getting. It's, it's true for me too. I mean, I, it was dumb luck that I, that I uh, landed at NEC and started studying with a young Will Hudgens who had just gotten the job in the Boston Symphony. 
and was super hungry to like pass along what he knew and talk about, you know, a role model. I was like, I can relate to this person. And, and that was, I imagine that you had a similar thing with Tim and that he, 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 he so, so down to earth and so real. Um, and, and I think both of those guys have that. And for me, that was, that was really important because prior to that, I was like, oh, well, you know, my teacher had like a pocket protector with three different colored pencils and wore a suit and tie. And I'm like, I can't, I'm, that's not me. So that, that was really, that was important for me. And I know Tim, Tim inspired you in that way too. Oh, yeah. I mean, to this day, to this day, there's, I mean, there's not a concert that I don't, I don't show up. And I think, uh, cause Tim had this, um, this pattern of things that he would do. He always showed up, clear the heads and then we'll do this warm up routine. And then every musician will show up and the, the drums were ready to go before the rehearsals and concerts. And I do the exact same thing just because I knew it worked. So yeah, as yeah. a role model in that sense, it was just like, I took everything I could from his um, work ethic and tried to make it the best I could in my, or my own version in what I do and what I do now. Cause I yeah. think those are the details that I notice as a student, as a student and students now, sh should be able to notice as they as they go. Although I do remember when when um, when I was in school, uh, Tim got me a permit so I can go see every rehearsal. So I went to see every rehearsal, and I will sit on the balcony behind the system conductor so I can always borrow a score. So I have my timpani part, and I'll have some sort of score. And uh, and I saw all these unbelievable conductors and soloists playing with the orchestra, and then Tim's work ethic as a you know as a performer in, in on stage. And these days, I, it's not it's not as noticeable, you know. Like students don't come as much to the concerts, and I think that's something that it, it was a huge part of my education. Um, that I wish it could be a little bit more intense these days. That's that is really impressive, and yeah, I I think I agree with you a hundred percent. I find that the biggest problem for for young people, and I, I know I was guilty, and I imagine you were too, because you just don't have enough time when you're twenty one to know all the repertoire. And think of how many hours of repertoire we really should know. We're not just talking about the excerpts, but the piece. And I think the biggest weakness for young people is they just haven't taken enough time to listen. I, it used to freak me out uh, just to think that I could get a job and not know the repertoire. <laughs> right. It used to be like a fear that I had, like, okay, what if I win a job and I had to play Ross and Cavalier and then I had to play some Beethoven symphonies and had this bar talk and I don't know it. So yeah. I needed to go and hear this music and learn it. So, and I took my notes and, and, and take notes from, from my teacher just to make sure that I actually knew the piece. Yeah. So if I got a job, I'll be prepared. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking with Parker Lee a couple of weeks ago. He's learning, you know, three hour, hour operas, you know, and playing them for the first time. Um, that's a whole different repertoire, but, but as a timpanist, you can't really just say, oh, I'll just learn these excerpts because all of a sudden, you know, if the first notes of um, 1812 Overture, if you don't know where to put that, you're in some trouble, you know? Exactly. And things happen, things happen, uh, some last minute repertoire changes or somebody in your section got sick and you had to step in and, you know, stuff like that can happen where you, you think you got it and then something changes and you have to be ready. You had to know the repertoire. Um, as much as as much as you can. Yeah. yeah, I imagine you learned a lot of you got a lot of experience in Charlotte playing through a whole a whole lot of that repertoire, which probably helps you a lot at your much more mature player coming to the Houston Symphony because of that. Exactly. I mean, uh, it's, it's related to what I was saying before. I, I tried. I made my job at that time be everything to me, so I can soak up every, all the stuff that. Besides, I had this. Uh, I had this urgency when I used to see. It, in those rehearsals and, and, and watch the orchestra, there was all this information. And at that point, it was just all this information, but nowhere to apply it. So I kind of had like a stack, a stack of information of stuff that I actually wanted to put to use. And that was that was uh, Detroit and Charlotte for me. Like I was, I was able to start getting that information, actually apply it and see how it worked. And then make my own version of it. How can I make this now be me so I'm not imitating my teachers or, or, or my role models, but I can actually now be me, right? And yeah, for my own way. Yeah, I, I can relate to that completely. But hey, is it okay when you're just starting out to just say, 
I want to play just like Tim Adams or I want to play just like Will Hudgens because that's exactly what I did. I, I just said, I'm going to do exactly what he does. Is that all right? I think it's totally fine because for one thing, it sounded awesome. Yeah. For one thing, I was like, wow, that sounds great. Yeah. Is there anything wrong with trying to do that? As long to me, as long as you at some point, you're always aware that at some point it has to be you. Right. Right. Because that's another thing like you do learn by imitation. And if, they, if the person you're imitating is an amazing musician, then yeah, absolutely learn that. But just be aware that at some point it has to be how you interpret it. And if you're a good musician, if you're a, 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 a flexible orchestral musician, that comes naturally because you're not playing with the same conductor that your teacher is playing with. You're not playing with the same orchestra that your teacher is playing with, and you're not playing the same hall. So right. you, you become aware of the circumstances and you go, okay, maybe I have to do something different. And that's how, you know, I, I play on different drums that Tim played. I play with different drum hands that he played and I have my own sticks. So, you know, it, it was like, I still have the concept, but I started to come up with my own ideas, how I thought, how I thought it should be, you know. Absolutely. In, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, in, in watching and hearing you play, it's, it's your own style. And I know there's a couple people in this room who would totally agree that when they were 25 and they thought they knew what they were doing, then they got to be 45 and realized it was completely different. They, they were like finally grown up. I'm looking at you, Larry Reese. I'm looking at you, Dave Herbert. I mean, you guys have like evolved into something else, right? I mean, that's one of the beauties of being a musician is, uh, I mean, I look at old videos of myself and I'm just going like, oh man, I can't stand to watch that. It's like, you're still, still learning. Better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, look, I, I do the same thing. I have videos from, with, uh, from lessons. Yeah. And I look at myself play. And, and one thing I noticed, number one, I'm imitating Tim. Right. You know exactly what he was doing. And I did the same thing when I was in Chile. I imitated my teacher there. Right. He was a, he is a great timpanist. And uh, I, I mean, he, he was the one that uh, started started me learning uh, all the concept of lifting, whatever it was. And I used to uh, imitate him as much as I could. And then I came here and I was doing the same thing with him. And now I watch his videos and I go like, wow, that's just like weird to see. <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah. But then you mature and then, you know, then it becomes something different. Yeah. But I, but I think, you know, I, I, I can totally relate to that because as you start out, it's so hard to figure out like, you know, what it's supposed to look like with your own physicality. So the best thing to do is do exactly what you're seeing that sounds good, that looks good, that feels good. And man, Tim does that. And uh, it, I, I always say this, I just wish that we weren't, and maybe this is this, this Zoom period in our lifetimes is how to break out of it. The fact that we're so segregated in the sense that there was the Cleveland school and there was the Boston school and the New York school. And man, there's something to learn from each of these people in spite of the difference in styles, which is usually just based on conductors, halls, traditions, um, doesn't mean you shouldn't learn them all. One, one thing I always tell people that I get the chance to teach is it's really great to learn these rules because there's all these schools, right? And um, it's, it's really good to learn all these rules, you know, put your fingers here, move your wrist like this, use this, use this muscle. You learn them so you can break them. Learn them really well and then break them. Understand the concept, understand what you're doing and then make your own and then, you know, go in your own way. And you may turn around and think you're playing, for example, with a, with a French grip and it's actually a German grip, but it sounds great. Or, you know, it's just because you understand what the concept was, but then you adjust it to your own physique, like you were saying, you know, your style of playing and then your environment. Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. This is an interview with Leo Soto. You are watching TAPS Tuesday Q&As. We are going to be raffling, or what do we call it, Harry? I guess it's, it's just the wheel, it's the wheel of fortune wheel, in which we're, I guess we're raffling off a lesson with Mr. Leo Soto. So uh, if you're in the room, uh, I hope you've got your timpani chops up because, you know, Leo doesn't have, I know I said you were the most patient guy in the world. So he has lots of patience, whatever your ability level. So don't, don't practice. Um, we got some questions uh, from Instagram for you. Um, the first one is, well, I'll save it because it's about auditions. Um, I always ask this, and being that you got Houston uh, at an advanced age, how many auditions did you take for professional orchestras overall? 
33. 33. 33, and I won three, basically. Yeah, I made a, I made a list after, uh, after I got this job. Uh, I went to do a master class at UGA, and they, uh, they actually wanted me to talk specifically just about auditioning. So I made a list with all the auditions, the ones that I advanced, the ones that I didn't advance, and all that. But all together, it was 33 auditions. Unbelievable. That is awesome. Wow. Um, and so the question is from Instagram is how did your audition approach change over the years? I imagine you learned a lot over those 33 auditions. It changed tremendously. I used to have a really bad attitude about not advancing. It used to be, that's, this is one of the, the biggest lessons that I learned. I will not advance and I'll be like, I'm out of here. I don't want to know anything about this audition anymore. This is frustrating and all that. I'm out. And then I realized that I learned nothing from it, right? I put my hours at practice. I, I got to the level that I thought I was getting. And then I realized that um, I wasn't learning what was happening at the audition itself. And that's when I started recording them, right? That's when I started paying attention to what I was doing before the audition, after the audition, while I was waiting and all that. And that was, that was a huge part of your of maturing, right? And then obviously after I figured that out, then I'll come home, whether I advance or not, I'll come home and listen to the recordings and take notes and see how that compares to the recordings I made, I made while I was practicing, right? And, and what are my tendencies? Where do I tie Where do I not pay attention to intonation, to rhythm accuracy, consistency, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's one of the biggest things that I think uh, made me mature over the years. And then the next one was, adapting to the environment, playing the room. Um, and, I can, and I can tell you, when Parker Lee won the job, I was in that finals. And a month after, I was in the finals for Minnesota Orchestra. And then a month after, I won this job, or this audition happened. And all those three rooms are ex extremes, right? At the Met, the audition in this rehearsal room, extremely dry. And then you go to the Minnesota Orchestra, which is a very live room. And this one is very live as well, but the committee was on stage. We played across the, street, the stage. So had I not spent time preparing each excerpt uh, with, with certain uh, variants, so I can adjust quickly to the environment of the room, I will, I will not have gone anywhere, I think. In other words, you're, you're practicing with sort of different dynamic uh, ranges, like deciding that forte might be more, sounding more like that's so uh, Correct. That as well as stick choices, uh -huh. a, a more articular stick versus a stick that articulates, but just enough, considering that there is no orchestra. Um, the distance between the, uh, the committee and the, and the candidates whether the screen is in front of me or it's in front of them, right? So it's basically on each excerpt, I had two to three versions of sticks that I will use and then adjust the tempo choices as well. Because I, I remember in the Minnesota Orchestra, there was this Delacruz etude, number 29 from the 30. And had I played it at the speed that I was practicing it, it wouldn't just be one mass of notes hanging one after the other one. Right. Even if you put a little bit of mute on the drum. So I took it down probably about 10 to 15 clicks. Yeah. So, so I can, I can, I can understand what I was playing and I knew they weren't getting the same. So, you know, th those kind of adjustments, it takes some, it takes some maturity, I think, to, you know, to approach them from the, from the starting process of getting ready for the audition. So, and then when you're in the audition, you've got your three, two or three possible mallet selections. And then you're sort of thinking on the fly, I imagine, in certain situations, because it'd be hard to work your way through everything before you walk out there. Sometimes you get a certain feeling from the room. You go, oh, this needs to be more articulate, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, a lot of the times you can also talk to other people. You know, if you're on the second day of audition or if you're not, at the end of the day, you can talk to people and say, hey, what do you think of the room? But, and, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, there is nothing wrong with being a nice person like you know you want to know of course this is my experience it sounds like this and you know uh you're not, saying it helps to be a nice person and to have friends you know so some people believe that i might be that's a hot take that's a hot take leo's hot take it helps to be nice <laughs> it helps so to be if, 
If you're not as nice as Leo, you've got some work to do. I imagine none of you are, so you've got some work to do. But uh, yeah, I, man, I, I think that all the time, especially um, when I think about going to auditions, as I mentioned, you know, we were the NEC crew. It's like the Boston crew. It's like, oh, those are Cleveland guys over there. But man, it would be so great if we thought of ourselves as one team, because in the end, at the audition, it's not really you against anyone else. It's you against you, right? It's you against you. I've always said that. Oh, you beat you beat 200 people. No, I didn't beat 200 people. You just either beat yourself or you didn't beat yourself. You, you, just, you played, you yeah, you, you played your game the way you wanted to play it. That's, it's it's just like one of those individual sports. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not really about the competition, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so being, so being that way, did you play well? Or, or you know, did, did you just like went there and, and did whatever? It's, it's, it's about how you approach it and that's it. The competition is against you. Hey, Leo, I got, a, I got a question for you. Have you ever been in an audition and you, you walk out of the round and then people say, hey, Leo, how'd it go? And you go, I nailed it. I'm totally going to advance 100%. If they don't advance me, they're fools. Uh, I never said that out loud. Okay. Okay. Good. I mean, so that's part one. Have you, have you ever walked out of that audition and said, they go, Leo, how'd it go? I suck. I just sucked and they're going to cut me. Absolutely. I know it. You ever do that? Yes. Oh, you have? Absolutely. Okay. Did that ever happen to you? And did you advance? Yes. Okay. All right. I did that too. And I learned after that, there's only one answer that you can say when, when they ask, when someone asks you, they go, Hey, Ted, how'd it go? It's an audition. We'll see. It went, okay. We'll see. Because if you say you suck, well, if you say you advance and you, you know, you're going to advance and you don't advance, then you're delusional. And if you would do advance, then you're cocky, right? Yeah, okay. If you say that you, you suck and you advance, then you're also being, you know, you're poking fun at everyone and you're cocky. And if you say you suck and you get cut, then people just think you suck. So you really can't, there's no other answer. You just have to say it went okay. Right. I mean, I've never asked a question to anybody. Right. Because I, I think it's invasive. You know, like you play your audition, however you played it, you know, good or bad, it's, it's your, but if somebody asked me, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't feel that I played well, I would say, yeah, I don't think I played well. And yeah. then, and then I go listen to my recording from the audition. You probably don't, there's things that we're probably just not able to hear in the moment because there's so much stuff going on internally and some adrenaline. It's hard to hear every nuance until you record it and listen back, right? Exactly. And that's the thing about, well, the tricky thing about Timpani is obviously, you know, they don't allow you to record. So I'll hide my, my Zoom inside my stick case next to the 32. So obviously all I hear most is the 32. <laughs> right. But I'll pay attention. I, I, you know, I wouldn't focus on that. I just focus on uh, rhythm consistency. You can hear that. Intonations, you can hear that. And yeah, you, it's exactly what you say. You come out of the audition feeling like, what just happened? What just happened? You know, it's just, it's just like, yeah. you know, all this adrenaline rush and you think things went terribly wrong and then you hear them and you go like, ah, actually, that's not terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I never recorded myself, but I, and I think had I, had I done more auditions, I probably would have started, but the, I did try after every audition as quickly as I could, once I got back to the, the dressing room kind of try and go through everything and come up with my list of things that didn't go well because otherwise i did this i was doing the same thing you were which was like you get cut and then you're angry and you don't learn anything from the experience so I, so that's that's what i i recommend is like you definitely have to if you don't record it you have to try and review it and have a good memory and, and recall of what actually happened so you, so you can learn from it whether it's good or bad you can always learn it and, and just come up with a different with a, with a clearer idea of what happened. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah. So uh, here's a question of also Instagram. Do you think students should start taking auditions right away or wait until they're really comfortable or does it just depend on the individual? That's a great question because I didn't think that I was ready for my first audition at all. Um, so you know, had you asked me at that, mo at that moment, I would say no way. And the only reason why I went, it was because I knew I was going to stay um, in school for longer. So I went and I bought this car that cost me $700. Wow. 
And I'm, I'm on my lesson and I tell Tim, Tim, I just bought this car, $700. And he's like, good, you're taking the audition in Canton, which was about an hour and a half away from Pittsburgh. You're taking this audition. That was my old, that was his first job when he was at CIM. So I was like, I, are you sure? No, no, you're taking it. Here's the list. He had the list. And, you know, and it was fairly standard, but still, I mean, I was freaking out. So I went there because my teacher told me to go, right? And I got runner up. So, <laughs> so what I thought was, okay, so I don't know all this music, but I think that if I practice this stuff that, and, and, and my teacher tells me to go for it, I'm going to go for it. Yeah. But what I will say to a student is if you, if your teacher believes that you should go, then absolutely go. Cause you, you don't see yourself the way, obviously an experienced people sees you, right? You don't see yourself the way your teacher sees you. And if your teacher says you're ready to go for this, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, a very similar thing for me too. Uh, Will, Will said, man, you got to go to this audition in Rhode Island. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not ready. He goes, no, you'll be ready. And uh, yeah, I made the, I made the cut. And there then, you but you know what, Leo, I didn't know that they held the finals like the same day. So it was me and Eric Milstein and they say, okay, be back at one. I was like, well, what happens at one? And Eric's like, oh yeah, the finals. I'm like, what today? And I was, I was a mess. I yeah. was completely, but it was a big shot in the arm, you know, to make that cut and, and the, le the lessons learned from each, each experience. But that first one, if it goes well, man, you can really get the bug, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy because you, you get that feeling, you get that feeling of, I, I actually can do this. Yeah. You know, and you're playing these excerpts, you know, you only get the one shot, you know, and, and you're playing them and you go like, this is how, this is how, it's, okay, this is how it is. Let's do it. Oh, and then, you know, you just learn from that and it's great. It's great. And you liked it so much that you took 33 of them. I thought, why not try 33 times? Well, let's do 33. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, the question is, what did you feel really changed in your playing when you started advancing consistently? You mentioned recording. You mentioned that you, you figured out how to play to the room, which I think is really interesting. And I think a lot of people are are not quite in tune with that yet. That takes some time, doesn't it? And I imagine some other things maybe in your practice routine that, that helped your audition taking? Yeah, and, and I remember we talked a little bit about this in the conversation we had in Indianapolis, but I came up with my own routine uh, for getting ready for auditions, which involved sight reading in Marimba. So I'll, I'll spend about an hour doing sight reading in, in my practice room in the Marimba just to practice sight reading, which I think is really important. So I did it with a few um, violin books. I'll do one hour of soft snare drum playing because even on timpani you know have control the sterility of soft playing is super important so I think now that's that a hot take I, lo I love that because i think most timpanists are probably not thinking that way and then you have to play the role for for anima variations and you, you're shaking on the role right so you know it, i mean i always think it like that so i practice all this soft stuff and soft roll because you know you, you're actually going to use it and then the third one was drum set because I strongly believe that when you play by yourself, when you're playing an audition exercise by yourself, you have to be very aware of where you're placing the beat. And an excerpt played on the back of the beat is an excerpt that sounds steady and mature to, an, to a listener. And um, when you play drums, you play in the back of the beat. You know, that's how you set up the groove. When you're playing the orchestra, you have to do the opposite because you have to deal with the distance. So. I, I, you know, I allow myself to sit on the drum set and just play simple patterns or more complex and have a very strong beat and being able to control where I was going to do it. And it was always on the back of the beat. So then after I got done with that, I can sit on the timpani and start working my excerpts and have all that already. Like, you know, that was the warm up. It really helped me, I thought. It's one of the things that makes the audition so much different from playing in the orchestra. You just mentioned it, playing on the back of the beat so it feels in the groove in the audition as a solo, and then learning to play it on the front of the beat with the orchestra, but still having it have the same groove that it has on the back. And, and for our audition here in Houston, every single part of it applied because we had side reading at the audition. We played, I mean, all together, I think I played four rounds 
uh, you know, behind the screen, or the last one was uh, without the screen. And then the next day, uh, the, the last day of finals, we actually play with the orchestra. So I play my excerpts on the back of the beat. I have my side reading taken care of. And then I play with the orchestra, which it was on the other side of the beat, so I can sound, you know. And I think all of that stuff came into play doing this audition that it, I mean, it was proven to myself that everything that I did, it actually really helped the process. Yeah. Yeah. So at what point did you change over to that sort of preparation that involves snare drum and drum set? I will say, uh, I will say probably the last three years of auditions that I did. So somewhere around audition 20, 24, 25. I'll say no, somewhere, I'll say probably audition 28. Yeah. 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 I mean, do you sometimes kick yourself, Leo, when you go, man, if I had just figured this stuff out earlier? All the time. Yeah. I kick myself all the time. Yeah, because, you know, one of, one of the things that I used to hate to hear after an audition is somebody coming to say, well, it wasn't meant to be. And I'd be like, how, how do you know? <laughs> you know that the Los Angeles Fairmoney was not meant to be. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> so, so, you know, I just didn't do enough for that. You know, so yeah, I look, I look, I kick myself. I look back and I say, man, if I would have been doing this, but it's, it's part of the learning process. I mean, well, and it, and it's also an inspiration for for anyone who's wondering, well, maybe you know, maybe I don't have what it takes, or maybe it's um, it's getting a little bit late. Um, and I think you know, you're a great example of someone who was really dedicated to the craft and you really have a love for for the music for the instrument for the art form and i think those things eventually led you to where you are but I, you know that you saying that it means a lot to me first of all it means a lot to me and at the same time two things are coming to play one is the first thing that we talked about you know like being the first native hispanic i didn't i didn't come and do all of these years of you know you leave your family you leave you know your brothers you leave your friends and you start you start from scratch right i didn't do that just you know to to do it it had to it had to have you know a, a higher a higher end i think yeah right um in other words you were be, because of how far you came geographically and culturally it was basically the motivation to say i can't half-ass this i gotta really work at it correct and then the other one was that in all of the jobs that I had previously, a lot of my colleagues will say, well, I know I don't take auditions anymore because those jobs go to all those young kids at New York, you know, all those young kids at Boston Conservatory, you know, they, they, they have the time to practice. They don't have, you know, and to me, it was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. <laughs> I'm just going to yeah. prove you wrong. Uh, that, was a, that was a big part of it as well. Yeah. So you've got, a, you've got a competitive side. I mean, you've got a, you have a chip on your shoulder. I do. <laughs> yeah yeah and and that you had to learn to manage it which i don't know if i have actually learned to manage it you know it's tricky it's tricky um but i feel like there's a there's a lot in the personalities of timpanists i mean it's one of those you know forgive me but it's one of those big ego instruments i mean I, if you you look at a principal horn player you know i think of uh dale clevenger you know rest his soul he passed away last year what an unbelievable principal horn player. And I heard him play that uh, solo in Mahler 5, uh, you know, dozens of times in all sorts of countries, in all sorts of halls. And every night it was just like the whole audience was like there. And the amount of confidence and ego, it's like, I don't blame him for having a big ego. If you can step up and do that. And I feel like timpanists are similar in that way, yeah? I, uh, I agree, I agree. Uh, I mean, having that presence, I think there's a, there's a, there's a thing of presence that goes with the instrument, you know, you can't hide behind and, and yeah, perhaps there is a certain personality that is required for that. And, and, and like I said, I've been very lucky that my teachers, the one in Chile and, and Tim, and then another timpanist that I'm very grateful for his help in my development is Dave Herbert. Um, he, uh, I've, I've, I, see, I see them not just as, as the timpanist, but also as a person. And there's a lot to learn from that. And I think I've shaped my, my life, you know, based on those people that, I, that I've seen to, throughout my, my time. That's, man, I mean, you, you really demonstrate the importance of, of great teachers and, and role models. It's, 
it's so unfortunate for me because all I've learned from Dave Herbert is to buy more Bitcoin and it hasn't really made me rich yet. And so I'm, I'm a little frustrated. Dave, are you are you able to comment on this? Uh, because here. Bitcoin crypto is, is in a little bit of a dip right now. We, we can all blame him. Then. Perfect. I do. <laughs> uh, he's uh, are you hey. there, Dave? Yeah, I'm here. Leo, hey. great, great stuff. Great to hear you. Ted, thank you for doing this. Um, this is uh, incredibly valuable, and I, I just learned so much from, and I have such great uh, uh, pride and satisfaction for knowing that I'm a small part in this kind of ever-evolving cycle of, of life and learning. So, so thanks for all you do, and um, everybody supports uh, Ted's uh, projects, uh, Ted uh, Taps Percussion. Uh, donate. These are great. Uh, these are great learning experiences. Uh, yeah, you know about the. <laughs> Dave, are you trying to make up for the money I've lost in crypto? Is it like with that free <laughs> if advertising? You, if, if if you've lost if you've lost money buying Bitcoin, I don't know what. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. But, but You're I do fine. remember okay. you. You told it's me about it years ago, and I was like, yeah. man, that's cracked, man. That's that's nuts. And I wish I'd listened. Yeah, yeah. You just buy a little bit every day. And you forget about it. It's it's uh, it's most the smart people in the world that I follow. They just uh, have it as an insurance policy and nothing more. It's not it's not it's it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's a don't get poor slowly scheme. So let me just, just issue this disclaimer. Uh, the yeah. the exp the opinions expressed uh, by some of our guests are not the shared opinions of Taps. This advice could either be. The thing that gets you the most wealthy, or it, but it is also the most speculative advice. And uh, Dave, I'm taking it. I'll just have you know, I am taking it. Absolutely. Well, if 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 you uh, if you just accept, um, you could accept uh, U.S. dollars or euros, or you could accept gold or silver or Bitcoin. Whatever you accept as donations. Let's put it this way: I'll donate it to you, and everybody can just make their own decision. And I'll. And I'll just say that whatever for you, Davey, good for you. From, whatever, from your lips to is, every God's ears, please, Dave, make that happen. Make it happen. Whatever is best for you and the future of your your projects, I'll uh, I'll chip in. So I got oh, I have my I have my horse in the race, and uh, I'm I'm sticking with it because I because I have a deep understanding of it. But um, I know you do. Mm -hmm. Now, if anyone in this room is not inspired by the words of Dave Herbert, <laughs> I mean, you understand okay. immediately why Leo has has had these great role models. It, it is, uh, and I, I mean that, Dave. You you are you are an independent thinker, and you think about music as an independent thinker. And so, I know that Leo benefited from that sort of tutelage, and and that and your playing has evolved in a similar way as you've gotten older. Am I right or wrong? You're right, and I, I will say this: uh, the the amount of times I had the privilege and opportunity to work with uh, Leo, um, it was very symbiotic, and I learned probably more than he learned from me. Just just to um, you know share ideas, and we just did you played pay, for each did other. Did you give him his money back? Uh, we didn't. Uh, we we uh, I think we had uh, wine and stuff yeah, like that. A, I don't think. Yeah, and some very good dinners as well. See, there yeah, you go. I don't, yeah. I don't think, I don't think there was much uh, cash uh, exchanged. I think it was just a sort of uh, uh, two friends getting together and um, trying to help each other out. And That's like awesome. I said, I, I learned, uh, I learned a, a, a ton uh, just from the interactions because, as you know, as a, as an educator, when you're dealing with um, top talent and people that are extremely motivated you grow as a musician that's one of the things i love the most about about teaching is because the more i teach and i get around you know these wonderful people i uh, I, I sound like i'm really sucking up i'm 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 genuinely not not like this i'm just i'm just kind of emotional because i'm just so happy for for uh leo in the first place and i and i know you know firsthand his uh his journey and um uh, just uh just to be a small part of it and yeah and and to, and to and to get to get to learn along uh with him 
is uh, is amazing. Yeah. So I'm gonna mute. I'm gonna mute myself because I catch myself rambling. So I'm just gonna. It's, it's, thanks for letting me chime it's, in. And, oh man, uh, it's awesome! Awesome to hear from you, Dave. And uh, yeah, I I always say, one. yeah. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us. Yeah, you, you are someone I would love to be able to. Uh, you know, play timpani for and bounce ideas off. Other people on my list, Leo, are Tim Adams and and Tom Freer, who who come from that Cloyd Duff lineage. And I did the, I went to the Cloyd Duff masterclass eons ago, and when Cloyd was doing it. And uh, man, talk about a presence! I mean, he epitomized, you know, the the timpanist in in terms of like his uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just just the way he presented himself. He was larger than life. He, he was one of those, uh, I was lucky that my, my uh, I got to the country in time enough to, to be to, and at the very last one that he did before he died. Wow. In, yeah, so, and I took my lesson with him, which I have recorded on, on, on VHS, believe it or not. And um, the thing that struck me the most, talking about his presence and all that, is just, uh, and the same thing that I think I've admired from, from uh, people like Tim, like Tom Freer, like, like Dave, is people that care about the craft. There is a care about the instrument, and there's a care about music. It's like about, you know, you care about your sticks, you care about the way you present yourself. And I think that's, it's extremely important. Just yeah. You know, because there's too much casual stuff that you see uh, quite often, you know? Oh, yeah. Like actual playing, it's not an important program and all that. And, and you know, and he was a very you know, strong advocate about no, no matter what it is, you have to give everything you have every single time. Right? Yeah. Playing Beethoven 9 for the 57th time, there's always somebody in there that is going to that is listening to it for the first time. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be their memory. And I, yeah, and I think his, his students reflect that sort of attitude. Yeah. I believe yeah. That. Uh, yeah, Ryan, thank you for giving me the word I was thinking of to describe Cloyd Duff. Gravitas, that's pretty good. Um, Larry Reese says Duff, class and elegance. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Bowie went to the Duff class in 2019. Yeah, cool. First participant from Indonesia. That's awesome. I think this is actually one of the one of the coolest things about. I I, I dare, don't dare say the pandemic because I we all want it to be over. But the fact that Zoom created this opportunity to connect with people in different parts of the world. It's actually how I got to know Tim Adams. It's how I got to spend more time with Dave Herbert, and and now we're all getting to know you better, Leo. So. You know that and, and just to be able to bring this to other parts of the world where clearly as we've learned from talking to you it was critical that you that there were some influencers that were experiencing what was happening in european and western percussion playing in orchestras and bringing it back to chile and so i think we we have to we have to make sure we level the playing field as educators and bring it to people that are otherwise not going to get it correct yeah i mean that's i think that's probably the same importance, you know, how much you do at your job as an orchestral musician and how much you do as an educator, you know, and that's why, you know, everybody who's teaching, everybody who's wor uh, working with their students, um, I just have so much respect because you're changing lives. Yeah. It's like through music. Well, and you're about to, you're about to do that for one lucky winner here. Uh, if, if I can figure out how to get this going here, can you guys all see this wheel? You guys seeing that? Cool. All right. All of your names are spinning around this wheel and it's really exciting. It's a tantalizing wheel uh, in the sense that right at the very end, it slows way down. And so somebody is thinking they're winning and then a lot of times they're not. So I didn't design it. So don't, you know, shoot the messenger here. But here we go. This is for a lesson with Principal Timmons of the Houston Symphony. Mr. Leo Soto. Now, this lesson is going to be via the internet, the internets and Zoom. However, I, I have learned if you're a motivated student and you're willing to put some good recordings together, there is lots to talk about and I'm sure Leo can be very helpful. So here we go. Tantalizing. It's not you, Larry. All right, Marcelina. Congratulations. That's going to be awesome. Marcelina, great player, great person. And uh, I look forward for you guys linking up. Uh, let's see, Marcelina, if you would, just 
throw your email in the chat. I think Harry's probably got it anyway, but uh, we're going to connect you and Leo. Um, so that's really exciting. Thank you all for joining us, and uh, it's been a real pleasure. There's one more question that I think we need answered, Leo, and uh, it is, does it make a difference bringing your own drums to an audition, we're talking timpani, versus playing the orchestra's drums? I, I bet it depends a lot on what sort of drums the orchestra has, right? Yeah, I mean, these days, Adams became the standard set of drums, so most auditions actually have Adams. Um, if you're allowed to bring drums, by all means, bring them. I, I mean, it's, it's a huge advantage for yourself. For yourself, it's just how you feel behind the drums, the, the drums that you know. Uh, and I mean, I can, I can uh, advocate because when I bought, I, I, I bought my first set of drums when I was in, in, in Detroit. Uh, and I was taking auditions and I was playing for, um, for Tom Freeman at the time a lot. And he was selling a set of drums that were German. And I bought them and I took them to Charlotte and I won the audition. That was the first time that I took drums to an audition. Yeah. And it was just like, this is great. Like I practiced on these drums and now I'm using them at the audition. Uh, so if that, I think that's a very uh, clear answer to the question. It is, doesn't guarantee you're gonna win the audition. <laughs> yeah. But, but it makes a huge difference if you can take your own drums. Yeah, I guess the first thing is you gotta buy some drums. So that's gotta, gotta save up or get your line of credit going, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I did. I went to the Musicians Union and I got a line of credit and I bought my first drums. Uh-huh. Yeah. The, there you uh, go, people. That's no that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this was this was awesome. Leo, you you are an amazing interview, just a really interesting person and I I can't wait to spend more time with you in person and hear you play. Thank you very much for being here. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me here. You know, it means a lot to me obviously and to see people and of course if anybody wants uh to answer or uh, has some more questions or whatever, please email me or you know and I'm happy to talk to anybody that I can talk to. That's outstanding, man. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, thank you to everybody for being here. We'll have another TAPS Q&A special edition next Tuesday. Do I have that right, Harry? Next Tuesday. Yeah, we're, we'll be interviewing Miss Cynthia Ye, who's, uh, as we know, the principal percussionist of the Chicago Symphony, and she took my spot. So I'm going to have some words with her. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Leo, thanks again. Thank you. We'll see you.